Hi, thank you so much for uh, coming to Chicago to speak. Um, you thank mentioned you. Uh, in, your, in your presentation about you know, the fear there are about 1,000 altcoins now, and you're going to see 10,000, a million. Um, with someone like Overstock, who's a, a major corporation, they're just starting to offer their own coin. Isn't it going to be a little much to to manage if, you know, for the average user, um, is, I think they need a coin to buy things from Overstock, to buy things from Whole Foods, to buy things from, you know, let's say yes, an average user buys things from 50 different brands. But right. They have 50 different altcoins. How's that work? Yeah, how do you see it? So I think it's important to realize that as part of the transition towards fully programmable digital money, one of the things you are changing is this idea of having very high um, uh, switching costs. So switching costs in economic sense, and uh, in, in, as a term used in economics, switching costs is the cost to um, switch to a different competing system. Right? I'm with Comcast. I want to be with. Oh wait, they bought all of them. Um, I'm with. Um, I can't find a single example of competition. Um, so. The theory in economics is that when you have two substitute goods and you try to switch between them, um, one of the considerations is the switching cost. Right? Now, so what is the switching cost with traditional currencies is actually quite high. If you want to switch from you know, USD to Euro or from Euro to Yen, there, there is some significant switching costs in that. Um, and for many people around the world, the, the switching costs are equivalent to infinity, because it is illegal or um, highly controlled as to who can use multiple currencies. So what happens in a world of digital programmable money is that the switching costs um, drop to zero. And if you have uh, liquid systems that can be swapped. So um, one of the technologies that I'm really excited about now is the application of payment channels and simple smart contracts to do what are called atomic cross-chain swaps. Who's heard of that term before? Okay? So an atomic cross-chain swap is when you take two chains and you nuke one of them. No. Um, <laughs> atomic comes from computer science, and it means indivisible. So an atomic cross-chain swap is a transaction that occurs effectively in a coupled way on both blockchains, where I'm selling my Bitcoin and buying Litecoin from another individual. And we do two transactions. I do a transaction on the Bitcoin network that gives them my Bitcoin, and they do a transaction on the Litecoin network that gives me an agreed-upon exchange rate amount of Litecoin. We both lock those in with multisig, and then we have secrets that we can exchange in such a way that they can't cheat me by taking the Bitcoin and not giving me the Litecoin, and I can't cheat them by taking the Litecoin and not giving them the Bitcoin. And that's why it's called atomic. Either both of those happen, or neither of them happens. And that way you don't have to trust the other person. You can put up the money. Worst case, they disappear, and three days later you just get a refund transaction. Um, but if all goes well, you can do a swap between. So what happens when that becomes completely and fully automated? When essentially your currency can transmogrify itself into another currency instantaneously, fluidly, liquidly. The other technology that is really exciting is the possibility of lightning network, which is routed payment channels, um, to have multi-currency capabilities, meaning that you have a, a lightning channel with some node, and you transmit Bitcoin down that lightning uh, channel, and at the other end, it gets converted and pops out as Litecoin. So effectively, the channel itself, in between, has an atomic cross-chain swap as one of its functions. And so now you have a multi-currency micropayments network that allows you to move any amount, even tiny, tiny amounts, with near zero fees between two currencies. At that point, what I hope to see is that wallets take over that, and you never see it. The wallet simply says, okay, I want to buy something from Overstock.com, the example you gave. Query the Overstock server. What currencies does it take? Here's a list. What currencies do I have? Here's a list. Which one can I do the fastest, lowest cost transaction between the two? Or maybe in my wallet, I've actually set it to optimize privacy. Which is the currency it's going to use that's going to optimize currency, or minimize transaction fees, or maximize cross-border activity, or maximize mixing? Why not? 
And then my wallet will execute an optimal strategy. It will convert what it needs to convert into whatever it needs to execute that strategy with a set of payment channels and lightning network channels it has. So eventually all of that disappears into the background. Uh, one of my thoughts is that maybe we start seeing a currency that only exists as a unit of account. It's only used for pricing and it's not used for the actual transaction. You price everything in that and that just translates onto everything else. Um, so who knows? If you uh, want to see a world like that, go invent it. You know, that's basically how open source works. Anybody who wants to build a wallet like that is going to be pretty useful. Uh, go forth and build.